so much. Very, very appreciated. Oh, man. We're, ha we're having a go at McClellan tonight. Oh, of course. That's for and understandably so. <laughs> yeah. what's, your, what's your take on him? Oh, um, I mean, just like everybody else, uh, influenced by um, what the history books say about him, but um, he was just too slow. He was, um, yeah, uh, he was a guy who um, who was just too, uh, he was too gun shy. He was, he was way too overcautious. He never took the opportunities that were in front of him. He stuffed up a lot of different, um, he stuffed up a lot of different things that he, that he, um, that would have been really beneficial had he, had he uh, acted quicker. Yeah, that's, that's basically my take on him. You know, Tom, getting back okay. to what you said earlier about um, Pinkerton. Pinkerton had this complex mathematic formula he'd come up with that was highly flawed. And then you add to that McClellan and his eagerness to believe the worst case scenario in any situation. It was just a recipe for disaster. And the problem is, if anybody had gone to Washington and pulled the 1860 census off the shelves and looked at the numbers, the evidence was there in the Census Bureau that just there weren't that many men available. It didn't have that many. That's right. It was flawed intelligence. But he uh, he did it. To, you know, at Antietam, he found the orders, knew that Lee was split in three pieces, and still took two and a half days to go after him. Yeah. You know, he could have done that in, in one day. He could have been over South Mountain, and that would have the war would have been over. Can you imagine if Stonewall had got a hold of that information? <laughs> Those boys would have been flat foot. Foot cavalry would have been flying all over the yeah. place, catching piece by piece. So he he always was just overly con, uh, you know, careful about everything he did, and he had no aggressive streak in it. He just did not want to be on the on the offensive, and uh, it just. It was crazy. He he had so many chances to win that war that first couple of that first couple of years. And, and well, especially uh, there. I mean, there's no way Lee should have gotten gotten out of there. Some was saying, uh, of course, you know, the Confederates are always going to under underestimate. But uh, Jubal Jubal <coughs> Jubal Early said that he he felt like there was no more than thirty five thousand men at Antietam. And well, he you was, know what? Or Lee he was very far left. Like that. He, uh, say that again. He didn't think Lee had thirty-five thousand men. He, he said that he thought about thirty-five thousand actually crossed the river with him. Or something. <laughs> Lee gave that order that they could uh, they could stay if they didn't have any shoes or had any other reason not to go, and and thousands stayed on the on the Virginia side of the river. So I wonder why McClellan, knowing that he's got him outnumbered that bad, why does he not just throw everything he's got against Lee? Because there's no way he could have held him off. Well, see, that's where McClellan comes into, uh, politics comes into play. By the way, let me back up on McClellan one thing, y'all. McClellan, when he takes, you know, he, he's the darling. He really becomes the poster boy for the Union war effort in early 62, late 61. You see all these patriotic envelopes and stationery with his face all over them. Uh, we talked, you know, earlier, he's a, he was a handsome, good looking guy and the, the papers couldn't get enough of him. He was a Democrat and it was, the, le the war was led by Republican Congress and Republican president. So that posed a problem. L McClellan gave an interview in, I want to say, January 62, where he said, you know, if I could have my way, I'd take the Navy and, and, and steam it down to South Carolina and I'd blow Charleston, South Carolina off the, off the face of the earth. And everyone was like, yeah, yeah, yeah. Then without catch, stopping to catch his breath, he says, then I would steam up to Boston and I'd blow, blow, blow Boston away because those were the two extremists that caused this war. <laughs> and that did not go over real well in certain quarters. He was no, McClellan was not an abolitionist. Okay, McClellan no, he steered clear of that. And and to the the radical Republicans within the Republican ranks, 
right off the bat there was all this well is he really one of us or is he a secret traitor and then what you were saying chris he's got all these men at antietam why doesn't he attack you know so and remember that letter i mentioned where the guy said you know he didn't yeah. push on through and you know so there was certain segments it was a minority but it was there that mcclone's really a traitor because his heart's not really in the union cause hmm. So that was I don't know. I mean, there was, you know, probably most of the army. Was, they were quite upset with the with the emancipation when it first came out. Well, I'm not well, saying is, yeah. I'm not saying it's right or fair, Tom. I'm just saying it existed. That's all. Yeah, not, uh, because you know a lot of people. There's a myth that the the the, 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 oh. the the union that the northern people you know were all abolitionists and that almost ended the war. I mean, when they found out, they said, "Hey, we're not going down here." to to fight this war over that i mean uh you can read you know numerous accounts of that my and, take on the situation is the average there there were some guys who were abolitionists all through that was their prime motivation free the slaves they were a minority i'm talking about in the army yes they were they were a minority they, were, they existed they were a small they were, minority they were a small minority the, the rest of the troops wanted the Union preserved. They didn't like slavery, but if slavery uh, uh, went away in the process, so much the better. You know, uh, you know uh, what I'm saying? I, 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 yep. I want to say, say something right there, okay? Uh, uh, and, and I, I want you to think about it for just a second. Uh, all of our life, we've heard that, you know, preserve the Union. You know, we, we was there to preserve the Union. We felt to preserve the Union. That sounds great. That sounds noble. I don't think it had a damn thing to do with it. What I think it, what it had to do with is uh, they fired on Fort Sumter and it pissed those northern boys off and they came down there to get get some vengeance. Well, I will say this, the decision to fire on the decision to fire on Fort Sumter was one of the worst decisions of the entire war. I don't know what was they what were they thinking? I mean, their thinking was, look, we're trying to let Europe know that we're an independent nation. And here in the harbor of one of our major cities is a fort by a foreign power. How can we claim we're we're an independent nation if if we allow that? All right. Here's what you, here's I thought this through. You're a confederacy, so you're basically you know essentially separate nations. South Governor of South Carolina signs a decree giving Fort Sumter back to the North, saying they no longer need it. You've got yourself out of it. Lincoln was a genius. He baited the South into firing oh, the first shot. Absolutely, he did. You're right. You're right. And, and, all- and when he got them to fight, then the, it, it came off the South as being the sympathetic to the North being sympathetic, and they played right into his hand. Yeah, it was a, it was a terribly strategic. It was a political decision and not a military decision, and it was catastrophic. Yeah. I don't know if that's the other reason you said there that also because it, it, it stirred up the patriotism in the north and you had a lot of guys that just joined up because they were pissed off. That, right. Because they were pissed off that they, how dare you fire on us. Yeah. But what yeah. happens, but, but now flip that coin on the other side, Tom, and you're right, but let's look at the other way. What happens two days after, after Sumter surrenders, Lincoln issues his call for troops to put down the rebellion. And that drives the four upper states. south out. Yeah, drives four states out of the union. Virginia, North Carolina, Tennessee, and Arkansas secede. And Missouri, mm-hmm. big three, Missouri, Kentucky, and Maryland, they're Maryland. seriously wavering. Maryland and mm. Tennessee would have gone if they had any any possibility of doing it. But uh, That's right. But they took Baltimore before they could get their act together, and they took St. Louis before they uh, That's right. better could get their act together. That's right. The governor of Missouri, I'm... I'm, I'm I'm born and raised in Missouri, so the war in Missouri is a uh, real. Uh, uh, yeah, my folks come Arkansas. from Missouri. Yeah. Well, well the governor, Clay- Claiborne Fox Jackson, was a secessionist through and through. Yep. But uh, speaking of bad political timing, he called a state convention to say people elected these delegates to the state convention to decide do we secede or not. But he tripped all over himself in January 61. And he wanted to lead him out and join the Confederacy. Well, there wasn't any reason at that point. So the convention said, no, if he'd waited just 60, 90 days longer, it would have been a whole different story. Yeah, they've done the same thing. Uh, 
Virginia did. Yeah, that's right. And boy, that could have made a difference because Missouri was a big deal. That was a lot of a lot of area, a lot it really of was. food. Well, I mean, you think if you had just a couple of those border states, you know, Kentucky, Missouri. You, you you know you've got to get some game changers there. You've got more territory you've got to conquer. Uh, you know more people to subdue. Um, um, you know I, I'm not saying the union couldn't have conquered it. Um, you know because I was in a discussion with somebody the other night and they kept saying they was arguing me the Confederacy had to win. I said the Confederacy did not have to win. They just had to not lose. That's right. Mm -hmm. That's right. But you know remember Lincoln says in 1861 famously. I think to lose to Kentucky is the same as to lose the whole game. Yes, it is. Yep. Yep. And I wonder why that was so important. I mean, because it was right there on the Ohio, you know, line, you know, I wonder why he, why he thought that was so important. That's that's one reason. And the other reason is rivers. You know, those uh, rivers, you got to think of those rivers as interstate highways. Yeah, that's right. And, and <laughs> the, the, the Cumberland, the, the Tennessee flow, flow, into the Ohio and Kentucky, and those were the routes they used. Remember at the first start <coughs> of the theater in the Western Theater. So yeah, and then of course it's right there on the river. You know, if you lose it, then you've suddenly got to defend Southern Indiana, Southern Ohio, Southern Illinois. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. and that's a long that's a long stretch to defend. I don't know how many mm -hmm. miles. It's hundreds. So I'm writing my um. I got to publish it now or start publishing some of the chapters I'm behind. You know, I finished my Richmond grad with now, so I've got my uh, my alternate history story, The Resistance. <laughs> uh, um, I'm having fun with that one. Um, about, uh, and yeah, because I've obviously wondered, because uh, I was speaking with somebody that the other day, I said, um, look, um, if uh, Lee would have found a way outside of Appomattox, he would have kept going. He was not going to quit. I don't care if they took the wood, what they had to do. I mean, you could have had a guerrilla war out of that. Sorry, we got off the case with McClellan there. Um, so let me go back to him. So after 1862, when he got relieved, uh, relieved of command um, uh, uh, after Antietam, he got sent to desk jockey, a uh, desk job. Uh, and even that, it was kind of a vague, vague job. It wasn't I thought even. it was something like uh, up north somewhere. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it wasn't a field command. Hold on a second. Let me look it up real fast. Yeah, I knew he never had another field command. And then, of course, he, he had to resign the army and he ran for president. Mm hmm Oh, by the way, one thing real quick to go back to what you said, Chris, a minute ago about Lee's options, you know, at Appomattox. Mm -hmm. Yeah. One of my favorite stories is a Confederate soldier is riding in a rail car. He's riding home after the surrender. And by the way, that's one of the great myths. The long walk home from Appomattox, the majority of them took trains. Now, mm. yeah, they were yeah, given given passes. They're given passes. I, they're given yeah. passes. The thing of it is, though, is, you know, you had to get out at the nearest stop, and a lot of them then had to walk 15, 20, 30, 40 miles home from the nearest depot, you know. But they didn't walk all the way back from Virginia like a lot of them think. But anyway, this guy's riding. This Confederate soldier, he's just surrendered at Appomattox with Lee. And there's in the car, there's a, a planter who's obviously set the war out, right? Yeah. And he looks at the, the soldier and says, I, I, excuse me, sir. He goes, I, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful, but couldn't you all have taken the mountains and kept the war going for two or three more years? And the soldier looks at him long and hard and says, friend, in the last three years, I was wounded twice. I've been shot at. I froze. I was captured and held a POW for six months. And I'm plum tickled with the way things turned out. <laughs> <laughs> he was going home and he, was a lot, he, he lived to tell about it. <laughs> but, yeah, I, I want to say something like that right there. Because somebody was talk, was asking me about that. If I, if, you know, if I thought something like that could take a place. And I said, look, I said, when he... Had, and I know that some men, it just, their bodies gave out and just couldn't take it no more. I said, but when he abandoned the trenches at Petersburg with his 25, 30, 35,000 mm -hmm. men, I said, they were marching 22 hours a day and they were still going with him. I said, they would have followed him to the gates of hell. They really would have. 
They really if that's were. where he said to go. I mean, mm-hmm. if he said let's make this last stand at Appomattox Courthouse, then my God, we'd be talking about last stand at Appomattox Courthouse today. That's right. Mm-hmm. I love the way, I've never, I've never understood. I mean, I understand he was desperate. So the strategy is okay. We're going to link up with Joe Johnston, right? Now, hold on, hold on, hold on, hold on. Let me stop you right there. Okay, um, that is. A myth. Um, you'll you'll hear people say that there was only one time that that was ever mentioned, and it was mentioned in a cabinet meeting. It was in it was mentioned in passing. Okay, now and and here I like to ex- further expand on it. Uh, here you are. You got two armies. Now you're trying to find Joe Johnston in North Carolina. You're trying to coordinate this link up. Coordinate it where with no communication and find each other and then link up. It's impossible. Militarily, it was impossible for them to have some kind of link up like that. Well, just and for I, hypoth- hypothetical situations, let's say they had really done it, right? Okay. So, so J- Lee joins up with Johnston. Graham would have joined up with Sherman. Right. I mean, <laughs> it just kind of complicates the problem even. It doesn't make anything go away. Well, see, in, mm-hmm. in one of the, and Tom can probably um, vouch for this too, because uh, uh, Tom was a military man in Vietnam. And, uh, you know, when you're in war and, uh, you know, even close to the end or whatever, and you're defeated, in your mind, you're not thinking we've lost. You're thinking of, you know, get, let's get resupplied, keep moving, and we'll fight another day. You know, you're, you're not thinking about giving up you're you're thinking about you know how 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 else can we win this war defeat surrender is not on your mind yeah well do you think that's a fair statement tom well it yeah until the point where i guess i mean what we're talking about here though is these guys were starving before they ever moved out of the trenches you're right Right. they they walked for for another week without Mm. eating uh, without sleeping yeah, their bodies had given out, but when they abandoned those, you know, uh, uh, Peter's, you know, the abandoned those stretches, you know, Lee's thought, and here's just my opinion Lee's thought was get out of here, get uh, resupplied at Danville. Get my army fed, get them back on the march, get some distance between me and Grant, and we'll fit it, figure the rest out later. Yeah, and you come back and once they're out, once they're out maneuvering again, Lee's Lee. You know, Lee lost yeah. his gear there sitting in Petersburg. Firing on forces for the first time, and the second one was staying in. They should have just give up Richmond six months oh. early. I said they should have gave up Richmond uh, in August of 1864 because you still had plenty of supplies in North Carolina and just shortening your supply lines and set up just a new base of operations and use the mountains. Been decimated yet? Yeah, I mean, they had a lot of options. Yeah. But, but you know, though, there's an intangible quality. The North... For instance, all during the war, the North was fixated on recapturing Fort Sumter. That held a huge psychological sway over them, right? Militarily, yeah. it wouldn't have mean diddly squat, but they kept trying to take Fort Sumter over and over and over throughout the war. Richmond had become so symbolic to the Confederacy that giving it up, I don't know if they could overcome that or not. Well, you know, I would like to say something like that, too, that you can <clears throat> keep in. I, and and I'll I'll do this post again one time. And I have a usually I have about uh, I, I, have a, I, have a, I have a large number of people that do agree with me with this, and a lot another large tell me I'm crazy. But I will I say that uh, Vicksburg should have been in ba- abandoned in 1862 because by the time Donaldson in uh, New Orleans fell, that city was of no military value whatsoever. They should have got their men and guns out and saved their military and saved their army and lived to fight another day. Uh, it became symbolic to the South because it was the Gibraltar of the South. It was kind of like Stalingrad. Yeah. And add to that, 
the president lived right down the road. Jefferson Davis's home was just down the road from Vicksburg. Uh -huh. That was <laughs> he was not going to let that fall. Now, I'm not saying that's right militarily, right? right. Strategically. But as far as reality, the reality situation, he wasn't going to give up Vicksburg without a fight. Let's say that, uh, you know, obviously he didn't win a major battle, but or, or let's say something happens, you know, Lee gave him the slip and they didn't get the battle or something happened, but McClellan retains command. How does this play out now? I mean, uh, you know, because, you know, you got Fredericksburg, Chancellorsville. I mean, does Lee ultimately end up destroying McClellan's army in a, in a maneuver and winning the war? Or does McClellan? Plan. What, Tom? Well, yeah, I think that's a very good case. <laughs> McClellan, I mean, he totally folded. At Mechanicsville, he was all set to make the charge the next day and win the war. He panicked himself out, and he wrote a letter to his wife that night saying he was going to go all the way down to James. He didn't know that until three days later, but he had already made his mind up to, to do a full retreat. And then the next day at Yankee Mill, he wasn't there. He was he was down the road a bit. And then at Savage's Station, the same thing. And uh, when at Glendale, he was on a damn gunboat. You think you think you McClellan if if. The South Park out of won the war with McClellan as the general. He just would have ever made any uh, of a. He would have tried to do another, uh, you know, grand, grand peninsula type thing, either doing it overland or going back to the peninsula again. Although I don't think Lincoln would let him do that, but he would get to that same point and then just and Lee would run all over him. Sooner or later, Lee was going to get lucky and, and beat the hell out of him. So we talked about, you know, him being a young, good-looking guy. How, how was he in such favor that he got command of this army? Say that question again? You broke up. That's we couldn't oh, hear I'm sorry, guys. We were talking about earlier, you know, he was, you know, charming, nice looking, young. Uh, who's, how did he gain so much favor and who with that he got command of the army? Well, he was a golden boy before the, before the war, and he had the victory of the war for the North. That's right. Tom, that's right. Tom nailed it. He'd won those victories in, in, in uh, West that's Virginia, right. and there wasn't, really, there wasn't really anybody else on the horizon on the Union side to offer it to. Nope. Nobody. Everybody else had been uh, beat. Remind, uh, refresh my memory. Uh, uh, was that Lee he beat in West Virginia? And how was he aggressive uh, during these battles? Yes. <laughs> well, I think some folks are saying it was a terrain more so than anything else that um, this in West Virginia that decided against Lee there, apparently. It wasn't so much for you. Um, it wasn't so much the uh, like the actual um, tactics on either side, but it was just the apparently it was just the uh, more mountainous terrain. But uh, Lee Lee was unable to really um, uh, like effectively cope with to uh, to enable him to win victories like he did later on in uh, like on the um, like in the eastern part of the state. That's apparently well, that's what some folks reckon. Well, Melvin was uh, was McClellan aggressive during this, or was it just how it played out? I mean, just had a, how it played out, basically. From what I understand, yeah, it was just for how it played out. Um, yeah, I think it was more so. Um, um, yeah, uh, they, I think um, he. Uh, I think from what I understand, West Virginia, like uh, I think they had uh, like the Union surveyor had uh, like the advantage of um, interior lines, uh, which they were able to better use. Uh, from their heartland uh, to uh, repel any um, to repel any Confederate um, incursions into that territory. That's the best way I understand it. Well, Lee, Lee also had uh, he had two generals there that absolutely hated each other, and they did not work together. And when he tried to coordinate them, they purposely sort of screwed each other over. Who were they? Mm -hmm. Rosecrans. I can't, remember, I can't remember who they were, but uh, Rosecrans was one. No, I'm talking about his his own generals, the Confederate generals. Oh, 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 oh I'm sorry. Oh, I'm yeah, sorry. I think they were. Yeah, 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 were less than than great generals to start with, and then they were they really didn't like each other, and they were not working together, and that's why Davis actually sent Lee over there to try to 
to be the guy that could pull them together, and it, he just he couldn't make them work either. It was just a mess. Yeah, just a mess. Remember one time he 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 got his troops all ready to go and had his his team moved up over the mountain, so all the ready to make a flank attack on the uh, on the big <laughs> union. His other the other other wing of his army never showed up, <laughs> so he just. <laughs> that he could trust and work with. So that was another part of the problem. Did, uh, mm. little, did Little Mac give his uh, Nick Seth nickname Little Napoleon? The Young Napoleon. The Young. He was the, the young, young Napoleon. Yeah, I think the Young Napoleon was his, what they called it. Mm-hmm. And Little Mac will be short. By the way, y'all were talking about, I, I just absolutely love this. Uh... You were talking about Lee in 61. Right before he sent to West Virginia, I got a letter, just got this recently. I just love this by a, a guy in the 21st Virginia, uh, ri- written in Richmond on June 30th, right? 61 or 62? I'm sorry, 61. 61, just, okay. So right before Lee goes, just right as about, Lee's about to go to West Virginia. President Davis and General Lee came out to the dress parade yesterday evening, and I had a good look at both. The president has a very pleasing look and conversed with a good many of the soldiers and shook hands with as many as could get to him and bowed to all the companies that passed before him, while General Lee looked savage as a meat axe and appeared in finer style than the president. Wow. Savage as a meat axe. That says an awful lot, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. Mm. Chris, Chris, you were asking... You were asking earlier about what McClellan did after he was fired. Yes. Uh, He was ordered. He was ordered to go to uh, Trenton, New Jersey and await further orders. And no further orders ever came. That's what I remembered. They they never they never. never He he spent all of 1863 writing. Well, all but uh, in, in, until into October, two, uh, two incredibly huge reports on the Peninsula Campaign and the Antietam Campaign, which of course made him look in the both both possible light. They came out in late October '63. The government didn't want to print them because it was obvious McClellan was getting ready to run for president at that time, and they didn't want to turn him into, you know, de facto campaign literature. But they had to go ahead and print them. And that was the end of McClellan's civil. That was the end of Little Mac's Civil War experience. You know, um, one thing I like to uh, say here uh, is um, um, the um, uh, sorry about that. Is that uh, you know when um, you know McClellan was uh, uh, basically at the enemy of the gates. Uh, that was a bold move by uh, Davis to bring Lee out from death duty to face a commander who had beat him earlier and just throw him at him. Mm. Yeah, but Lee was more than just a desk officer, though. He was known and, 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 and recognized. And again, who, what options did Davis have? Well, I mean, yeah. Well, yeah, that's a good question. But I, I guess my point is, is you've already got commanders out there who are on the ground and who are apprised of the situation. Right. And there you've got a guy back in Richmond who's really not uh, aware of what is going on and uh, unaware of the unfolding situation as it happens. And you bring uh, him out. Uh, you know, Lee. Lee was responsible for Jackson doing the, the Valley campaign. That's right. I mean, Lee was very much involved with everything that was going on, uh, including what Joe Johnston was doing around Lee. So, right. I, I, right. That, that, that's, a, that's a big difference, though, Tom, than being, you know, up there in the midst of it than being back in Richmond, you know. Well, they were only six miles away. I understand, but that's still a, uh, you know, that's still a good bit of way, uh, uh, as opposed to being right there, you know, uh, abreast of, and everything that's going on. Being on the front line as opposed to being in headquarters. Right. Right. 
Yeah, no, I mean, yeah, you've you got a point, but I guess my point was that Lee was very much of, of involved in the strategy, and I think that he probably uh, understood probably what something was doing that David did. So David constantly did. Now, I don't know if y'all, um, if y'all listened to any of the, me and, um, me and Luke, Lucas Wilder, you know, the, the Wilder historian, me and him have a bi-monthly show uh, that we've been doing now uh, on the Civil War, and we was talking about um, some of this other night. And he, he's of the opinion that uh, Lee was not going to be the permanent commander, that Davis was going to put somebody else as the commander, but the way Lee just knocked him back off the, uh, away from the gates, that he decided to stay with him. That's interesting. I've never heard that. I had never heard that either. And he said he couldn't say it was 100%, but he said he had had heard some historians say it. If you've not watched any of them, you should check them out. They're very excellent. Well, well so it, it makes sense because Davis has got to deal with the crisis. You know, like Tom said, they're six miles down the road, right? So he's got to do the best. He, he can make the best decision he can real fast. So Lee is at hand, so he grabs but it. I Sorry, no, I'm, I'm, I'm just needing that you guys know I should, I should run now. Sorry, guys. But, yeah, it was great to meet you for, in person. Nice to meet you finally, Melvin. Nice to meet you, sir. Okay. We'll have it for Melvin. Okay. okay. Catch you next time, fellas. I look forward to yeah. the next time around. See you right again on. soon, fellas. Bye. Take care. Likewise, likewise. I mean, you know, it, it's just an amazing hand. And, 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 I, I'm, and I could be totally wrong on this, but I think, and um, uh, Joe Johnson got had not got shot. McClellan would have won the war then. Well, oh, he, yeah. he might have gone ahead and, and done that uh, frontal assault that uh, he should have should have done anyway. Yeah. yeah. So his yeah. plan start the uh, you know his his offensive started on the twenty fifth, which was the day one of the seven days. And his yeah. next plan, what he wanted to do there was just to go another thousand yards or so up to get some high ground to put another siege gun up there. He was still thinking in terms of siege. He still did not want to do attack. But uh, right. but, but he probably would have, uh, the way Johnson was, you know, they're both very, very much the same. They're very defensive minded and nobody want, you know, he didn't didn't want to take any kind of undue risk. And he yeah, one, 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 one fight. I, I am not, gentlemen, I am not a Joe Johnson fan. Uh, and I, I believe, I believe. Of, go ahead. If Lee had, if if Johnson had not been wounded, it would have been Atlanta. He would have withdrawn from Richmond eventually, you know? You know, I, I don't know if he would have actually withdrawn from, I don't know if Davis would have allowed him to do that. Um, I think Davis would have probably changed commanders before he allowed that. Probably. Uh, but I am not a Joe Johnston fan either. Uh, I was just looking at some maps today of, uh, the Atlanta campaign and the mountain passes up there and where there were just very few passes for him to get through and how he let him get through there. Um, you know, they praise him for his Fabian strategy. Uh, okay. I, Fabian strategy is very successful, but it also has to do with a place where you have lots of territory, like in Russia, where Russia could trade territory for time. Yeah, you can't right. trade that much territory in Georgia. He no. gave up, he gave up, I think, a hundred miles in sixty-six days. Can you imagine Robert E. Lee giving up a uh, hundred yeah. miles in, in sixty-six days? Oh. Um. So, uh, you know, as far as I mean, so, it, it, and when I was looking at this, I was thinking about the Union commanders and Union generals, you know, and as opposed to obviously, um, uh, you know, Grant and Sherman, um. I, I would have to rank McClellan probably right behind those two. When you can look at the guys like Pope and Hooker and Burnside. Um, uh, uh, Hooker, wasn't, Hooker wasn't a bad guy. Hooker had a great plan at Chancellorsville. He pulled it off successfully. He had already, he had taken a totally demoralized, probably somebody with an army that was in bad a shape as it was after Antietam, after Fredericksburg, and turned it around. Uh, and then he ended up getting, you know, shell shocked and 
didn't you know didn't turn over the reins to anyone. That's what really happened at Chancellorsville, I believe. He he had, I mean, and that could have been it that week, but he has Lee trapped between an army twice Lee's size in a vice grip, and he digs in. Yeah, yeah. When he when he called them back out of the after they broke out of the wilderness, Meade and whoever else it was that had gotten out of the wilderness, and he called them back in. Uh, but it was his plan was to let Lee attack him, you know, under, in those defensive in the woods. And it might have worked if he had kept his act together and called in his reserves and things that he didn't do that day. Uh, you know, well, the Hooker wasn't that, that bad. I mean, and then in it, on the Atlanta campaign, he did very well. You know, he, he but, performed. But he was, but he was not the car. But he was not the the army commander, though. He does very good at Lookout Mountain and throughout the bulk of the Atlanta campaign, and he doesn't get credit for it. But remember, some guys are meant to be offensive coordinators. Some guys are meant to be head coaches. Right. Yeah. Um, but I, anyway, I'd put him. If you're ranking generals, I'd have to put him as number three or four in that in that group. I mean, he was he, what he did was good, except for screwing screwing up one day, right? And he had it. He had a concussion when he did it. So uh, give him give him a break, a little break. Huh? Okay, I mean, I'll, I can slide him a break on that. I mean, you know, everybody has a bad day on occasion. Um, you know, um, that day just kept happened to come on the worst day of his career, though. Yeah. <laughs> um, now, um, you know, I think I'll cover everything. Um, and I'll cut this part out unless y'all got anything else y'all want to add about McClellan because I oh, want to but, talk to y'all something let's in private. One more second. What did was he hit before or after he called for the uh, for uh, taking the people off of the uh, what was the grove, Shady Grove? Uh, the the high ground. Uh, oh, I, I don't remember. I thought he got with, hit. I, I think he did it after he was shell shocked. I think that's it. And that was his big. That's was his downfall. Whenever the when. Uh, uh, I can't remember exactly how he got shell shocked. Tom, Tom, you can't. Uh, you can't take away. He left his right flank up in the air. He did that. That's true. <laughs> he that is true. He did that. And. Sherman and you know Stewart but found that, it, but that wouldn't have stopped them. I mean, they were they were stopped on day three. You know, they fought them to a standstill right there. So, you know, Eleventh Corps crushed and all that good stuff. But the next day, they were ready to fight, and they could have fought, and they probably could have won if what? again General had not been knocked unconscious. You know, and he he had, I think, two or three corps that he never even engaged. Yeah, yeah, they were still on the. Uh, on the uh, north, north of the uh, well, they weren't north of the river, but they were they were north of the battlefield, right? They were staged up there on the yeah. north, and never never called up to action. Well, I'll tell you something else too that he never gets credit for that did go right was taking Fredericksburg and driving the Confederates out of Mary's Heights. You know, um, you talking yeah. about uh, the first or second Fredericksburg? The second Fredericksburg. Yeah, second, yeah. Yes. Yeah, that, yes. That, yes. You know, that that went very well according to plan and uh was part of hooker's hooker's grand strategy and it, it, everybody just kind of glosses over that uh -huh. yeah, yeah yeah i mean his, his strategy for that campaign was excellent oh, was probably the best one they had i mean up to that time um you know I plan on, um, you know, I, mean, I, love, I hope y'all are enjoying these as much as I have. I hope we had more participation than that. Um, I plan on having a couple of these a couple nights a week. Um, um, y'all are in on them. Um, and, and before we cut off, um, there's one time I want to talk to y'all something off air. Um, uh, uh, y'all got uh, any other things y'all think we should talk about with M McClellan? Um, Just one more, one more thing, Chris. I think one of the things that hurt us tonight was starting so late because it was yeah. 10 30 here in the east, and a lot of well, folks had to go back to work in the morning. I think yeah, that worked against unfortunately, us. Unfortunately, I had to watch uh, Ole Miss and uh, Louisville. So, uh, <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, that, um, you know, that like, like I don't know if y'all see my little post I had about a 
football season, it said, um, you know, if somebody has died, don't call me. There's nothing I can do for them. And at that point, there's no fort sense in either one of us being sad. <laughs> I got a kick when I read that. I'm like, it's Saturday in the South. What else is going on today? There you go. And uh, back during uh, last year, I, 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 I can't remember if I was playing Notre Dame in the playoffs or it was a national championship game. And I said, do not, under any circumstances, message me during this game. <laughs> I remember that. Yeah. I worked for uh, four years. I was communications director with the South Carolina Attorney General's office. And the Attorney General of South Carolina is and still remains such a huge South Carolina football fan. We were not allowed to even talk about the game of South Carolina on Monday of South Carolina lost. <laughs> and matter of fact, well, it was I really a good they, idea to stay out of contact with him on that Monday. Y'all, didn't, y'all, didn't, y'all must not talk a lot back then. <laughs> not, well, that was during the good years, during the Spurrier years. Oh, now during the Spurrier years, yeah. yeah. Yeah, uh, I'll go ahead and stop this court now. We're gonna finish talking. Uh, yeah, during the Spurrier years, now you know that was uh, um, yeah, it's a know, that story was, now. Yeah, 